So when the left and the media aren't pretending that satire videos are real for the sake of attacking people, uh, people on the left are also proposing some brand new ideas. There's only one problem. These brand new, uh, new ideas, they're basically the same as the, the old ideas. So, for example, Elizabeth Warren, she's presenting a brand new idea. It's brand new. What is her idea? She wants to run for president in 2020 as a Native American. And she says that she wants a 50% tax rate. That's what she's looking for, a 50% tax rate. Now, let it be said that people in the top brackets in the United States are already paying the overwhelming majority of actual net tax dollars toward the federal government. Like It's not even, it's not even close. And people at the upper end of the tax spectrum between state and federal taxes are paying well in excess of 40%. If you're in the state of California, you're already paying closer to 50% of your money to taxes. But Elizabeth Warren says we need a 50% top tax rate. That's going to fix all of our problems. What's too high for the top personal rate? It, it, I, it's not about a number. That's what negotiations are all about. It's that... Is 50% obviously too high? Look, there was a time in a very prosperous America... Mm -hmm. Uh, an America that was growing the middle class, an America in which working families were doing better generation after generation after generation, where the top marginal rate was well above 50%. It's 90%. That's exactly right. Okay, the left never, ever, ever will actually give you a straight answer on this particular question. When you say to them, what is your preferred top tax rate? They'll never tell you that it's 100%, but it basically is 100%. Now, folks on the left will say, you know, when, when the tax rate's really good is when the top marginal tax rate was 91% under JFK. Ignoring, of course, the fact that everybody basically avoided paying the 91% top tax rate with a variety of loopholes and deductions. But if, if, if you really believe that this is a winning campaign in the United States, a winning campaign is I want to raise everybody's taxes dramatically, talk to Walter Mondale circa 1984. Hey, this, this is your program. Let's raise taxes incredibly high. Yeah, genius, genius ideas from the left. Also, Outrage is on the program as well. So Cory Booker also wants to run for president in 2020. This is why when people say that Donald Trump is running at a disadvantage in 2020, I just wonder who they think he's going to run against. If it's going to be Elizabeth Warren, who's sending smoke signals, or Cory Booker, wild-eyed Cory Booker, the advantage has to be with Trump. Cory Booker is the senator from New Jersey, one of the senators from New Jersey, along with the, uh, the execrable Bob Menendez. And Cory Booker has decided that he is going to play crazy eyes Mr. Potato Head in his 2020 campaign. He's going to get out his angry eyes, slap those things on, and then he's going to go out and campaign. Everything that he says is five times too crazy for actual, for actual moderate politics. Here he is yesterday suggesting that anyone who supports the nomination of Brett Kavanaugh for the Supreme Court is complicit in evil. And behind him is Elizabeth Warren. Even she looks awkward over this. There is no neutral. In, in, in a moral moment, there is no bystanders. You are either complicit in the evil. You are either contributing to the wrong or you are fighting against it. Okay, the, the outrage routine, every time Cory Booker speaks, he thinks that he is doing the McCarthy era, have you no decency, sir? And it grates really, really quickly. Moral outrage does not work against President Trump, and it doesn't work on the American people. When you're talking about the nomination of Brett Kavanaugh to the Supreme Court, the left is already attempting to mobilize against Kavanaugh's nomination, not by suggesting that there are holes in his legal resume or by asking specific questions about his record or how he will rule on future cases, but simply by stating over and over and over again that you are evil if you support Brett Kavanaugh. Well, this was exactly the thing that led to Trump's presidency in the first place. Everybody on the right got tired of hearing they, will, they were evil for disagreeing politically, and so the left is doubling down on all of that. So what have we learned from the left in the last 24 hours? We've learned that their program involves dis, dishonestly suggesting that satire is actually real for the purposes of attacking people. We've learned from the left that they want tax rates radically elevated, and we've learned from the left that you are evil if you support a judge who disagrees with Cory Booker on abortion. This is what we've learned from the left. Yeah, the radicalization of the Democratic Party is happening in real time. And this is not me suggesting this from some subject, subjective point of view. Real Clear Politics has these charts uh, that show sort of the movement in the party politics over the past 20 years. And what you see is that the Republican Party moved to the right, leading all the way up till 2010. And since 2010, the Republican Party has basically been stagnant in its policies. And what you see is that the left, the Democratic Party, has moved radically to the left since 2010. And that's not a giant surprise, because just watching it in real time, you can see it happening. I'm old enough to remember when Barack Obama was running on, on behalf of traditional marriage and suggesting that he didn't want to raise taxes in 2008. And now you've got Elizabeth Warren, who's going to run on transgender bathrooms and 50% tax rates. That might be a little bit too radical for the American people. Now, the other angle that folks on the left could take is that the Republicans in Congress aren't checking President Trump quite enough. That the Republicans in Congress are letting President Trump have his way. The 
problem is it's hard to come up with the evidence that on policy they're actually letting Trump have his way, except perhaps on the issue of tariffs, where Congress really should seize back its power. It's a, it's a legislative power under Article I of the Constitution to handle tariff policy. But on other areas, a, for example, on Putin, the left has suggested that the Republicans are complicit in allowing President Trump to sell out the country to Vladimir Putin, except for the fact that the policy that has been promulgated by Congress is much harsher under President Trump than it ever was under President Obama. Yesterday, for example, Senator Mitch McConnell, the Senate Majority Leader, Cocaine Mitch, he came out and he said that Speaker of the House Paul Ryan, the two of them would not be welcoming Putin to give some sort of joint address to the Houses of Congress. So they're not going to go along with the sort of warm feeling that President Trump has for Putin. Again, the policy that Trump has pursued via Putin is very different from the verbiage he has spoken via Putin uh, with regard to Putin. Here is Mitch McConnell elucidating. Well, I can only speak for the Congress. The Speaker and I have made it clear that uh, Putin will not be welcome up here at the Capitol. Okay, well, again, if the idea is you need to elect Democrats to check the President of the United States, I I'm failing to see where Trump has really overridden his constitutional boundaries, except in the area of tariffs. And there is a case to be made. The Republicans should stop him on that stuff for the sake of Trump's own presidency. But the, the case for a Democratic Congress has never been weaker, I think. And that's why I'm so bewildered by folks like George Will, who have suggested we need Democrats in Congress to check President Trump. You may not like President Trump, but the policy that is emerging from the Trump administration is not the same as President Trump's personally, his personality and what he, and what he believes personally. They're not quite the same thing at all. I'm not sure how you trust Democrats, especially considering this final plank of the Democratic platform that I'm going to talk about in just one second. So final plank of the Democratic platform apparently for 2020 is going to be plastic straws suck. And no, I don't mean that in, in punny fashion. I mean that they're no longer going to allow you to slurp through plastic straws in cities like San Francisco. According to the San Francisco Chronicle, Soon to be heard in San Francisco, the last slurp through a plastic straw. This morning, my kids wanted to drink some tea and they wanted to use plastic straws. So I guess I am now complicit in evil, according to Cory Booker. This board of supervisors passed an ordinance on Tuesday that will prohibit the city's restaurants, bars, and retailers from providing customers with plastic items such as straws, stirrers, or toothpicks beginning July 1st, 2019. If the ordinance passes the board on the second reading next week, it will then be presented to Mayor London Breed. If the mayor signs the measures, retailers will be prohibited from selling single-use food service products made with fluorinated chemicals. So you're not going to be allowed to get like a Starbucks cup anymore. Instead, you're going to have to use biodegradable straws that taste like corn every time you use them. Bars, restaurants, and cafes would only be allowed to provide products like condiment packets and napkins upon request or at self-service stations. Supervisor Asha Safi, she says, this is about changing people's behavior. Do you really need to offer a straw with a glass of water? Well, yeah, I mean, I kind of want the straw. So a little bit. And if, by the way, all, all of the all of the propaganda surrounding plastic straws is absolutely silly. When people say that plastic straws are actually contributing to the degradation of the environment in a serious way, it's just not true. OK, there, there's basically a survey that was done by an eighth grader suggesting that there are eight million plastic straws that are thrown into the ocean. But that's just not it, it's not true. It's not true. OK, they, it's this is your program now is to make life more. So poop on the streets in San Francisco. Fine. Straws on the streets in San Francisco, not okay. Open needles on the streets of San Francisco, fine. Straws on the streets of San Francisco, not okay. Plastic straws are not the problem. If you want to talk about ocean pollution, by the way, what is really polluting oceans are nets. Okay, that's really what's happening. The anti-straw movement, according to Bloomberg, took off in 2015 after a video of a sea turtle with a straw stuck in its nose went viral. Campaigns soon followed with activists often citing studies of the growing ocean plastics problem. But this well-intentioned campaign assumes that single-use plastics have much to do with ocean pollution. That assumption is based on some highly dubious data. Activists and news media often claim that Americans use 500 million plastic straws per day, which sounds awful because that's stupid. There are only 300 million Americans. Okay, in this room, guys, on average, how many plastic straws do you use a day? A day. Okay, that's right. Okay, I use zero. Senya uses zero. Mathis uses zero. Okay, the, the, num the notion, that means that for all the three of us using zero, in order for us to get to 500 million, there has to be some person out there who's using 10, pl 10 plastic straws in a day for that to average out to 500 million. And somebody has to be using 10 plastic straws. I don't know what they're doing. I don't know if they're like snorting cocaine with straws piled up the wazoo, but that's real weird. Yeah, the source of the figure was actually a survey conducted by a nine-year-old. Two Australian scientists estimated there were 8.3 billion plastic straws scattered on global coastlines, but even if those straws were suddenly washed into the sea, they'd account for 0.03% of the 8 million metric tons of plastics estimated to enter the oceans in a given year. But don't worry, the city of Santa Barbara has also passed an ordinance that will allow restaurant employees to be punished with up to six months of jail time or a $1,000 fine 
for giving plastic straws to their customers. The bill was passed unanimously last Tuesday. A thousand dollar fine. So if you go to a table and you just give four plastic straws to people, that's four thousand dollars. Or you could do two and a half years in jail. You could do two years in jail for giving four customers plastic straws. Santa Barbara's ordinance is likely the most severe straw ban in the country. But of course, it is not the only one. By the way, Santa Barbara didn't just ban plastic straws. They also banned compostable straws. So I guess there are no straws available at all. So I guess if you're a disabled person who actually needs to sip through a straw, you're basically screwed, right? I mean, I guess that you could probably have a lawsuit based on this. This is this is pretty nuts. Okay, This is pretty nuts stuff. But again, the left is not known for its moderation on issues of virtue signaling. And this is merely the latest example of all of that. So again, I'm very glad that the leftists have decided the crucial threat to the planet is plastic straws and that that must be ended immediately. But the spread of, of poop on sidewalks, that's cool. Homeless people occupy.